So before we just dive back into our interesting conversation about where the world is going in 2022, I'm just going to present you, Robin, aka Supermassive. So you're That's the me. head of you're the head of video and multi multimedia at the Defiant, and you're a thought leader in DeFi and uh, in the Web3 creator economy. Welcome to the Yield Labs podcast, man. Thank you very much. Well, I, I, I balk at the idea of being presented as a thought leader. I don't think anybody in this space can truly be considered a thought leader. I think we're all kind of blind and groping our way so, through stuff. Like the creator economy, I think, is it, it, there's more data to give us a sense of leadership if you spent time in that. But DeFi, I don't know, man. It's it's constantly changing. The regulatory environment is is uncertain, shall we say. And therefore, anybody who's holding themselves up as a thought leader or presenting themselves as a thought leader, uh, that should be taken with a pinch of salt. And I think it's probably one of the things that has gotten a lot of people in this space into trouble is either presenting themselves as thought leaders or following blindly the people who present themselves as such. And I mean, it's a big topic for the space, but it does kind of overlap with what I'm really interested in, which is the creator economy and people whose opinions tastemakers the people who we follow on social media and how their opinions shape our own it's a it's a fascinating space and a fascinating world so either everyone is a thought leader either no one is basically in the space but uh, what all it is. i think i think it's yeah it, it is what it is because it's so new that as soon as everybody can put themselves uh, out there because crypto is very new and because of these new technologies and this new wave of everybody can be a kind of blogger or or journalist basically with just web two, uh, like the, the, the mix of the intersection of these two things is just making, just making it that every, everyone can become, or at least seen as one, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, you definitely saw it during 2021 that there was a new breed <laughs> of crypto parasites that had a, had a really good line in telling people what to think and, and presenting themselves as experts. And, a lot of those now have egg on their faces or there are governmental organizations that are coming after them. And even people who were like big in 2017, 18, you know, like Ian Bellina, like, wow, mm. it's 2022. Yeah. And now, now they've, they're coming after him. He must've thought he got away with everything, but no, that's yeah. not how this works. It's yeah. It, it's a, I think a lot of it was accelerated by the pandemic as well. You had this, kind of narrowing of everyone's focus and people had much more spare time so they had a lot more time to think and research and you know bad research is one of the the most well packaged things in crypto particularly but i mean across the whole spectrum everyone who was creating content during the pandemic was doing so because they had nothing else to do and so they were just putting their thoughts together and there was this explosion of ideas and explosion of intersection of different people from different walks of life who were all thrown together. It was this great equalizer moment. And that was very exciting because you were rubbing shoulders of people you would never normally rub shoulders with in clubhouse or in Twitter spaces. And you felt this immediacy to people whose opinions matter or who are important. And of course it's a complete illusion, but these complete, but these Complete. things, they, they, the, the history has a habit of throwing these things up, particularly in social media. Because I, I went through a phase where, I mean, I'm looking at the camera you're shooting on right now. And I'll make a guess as to what it is. But it's it's a nice camera, but it's not a massively expensive camera. And what it's doing it is, is it's tracking your face. And it has like autofocus and it will track your face. And if you move too quickly, it'll wobble and drop in and out. But fundamentally, the image that you're presenting me right now is very, very nice. Now, those cameras first started appearing in 2011, 2012. It was the Canon 5D. What happened then was that people who had traditionally been like shooting on film cameras and shooting with these very expensive equipment, but had earned their way there, were now talking to people who were mainly photographers who were just starting to make their first foray into film and creating videos. And you had this explosion of creativity when these two communities met each other so you had all this amateurish enthusiasm from photographers and then all this kind of wow we've got these great new tools and we can do all these exciting things with them from traditional filmmakers and cinematographers and for about a year and a half they chatted to each other they had a great time and all sorts of weird and wonderful things happened and then they moved apart again so the, the film industry has now bifurcated once more and film cameras 
even though you can get ostensibly the same result with a with a stills camera anyone who's a pro knows that those cameras are not for kind of professional use so this I, I was blogging during that time and that was the first time I started making content for a kind of I guess you call them a, a feverish obsessed audience and got to see it firsthand but it was just wild seeing that same paradigm play out in 2021 and the nfts were the battleground for all of that which was which is hilarious um oh i'm creative i love art do you seriously do you <laughs> come on would you say would you say even like this crypto thing is something similar that happened with with finance basically and i'd say like even even the entire investing slash meme stock game like everybody became an investor everybody became a trader yeah that, that i mean th this is nothing new again like what happened in last year was accelerated of course by the conditions of the pandemic uh but we saw i mean the same thing played out in 2017 you got had all these shitcoin traders there were paid telegram groups there were people on twitter who were calling coins and building clout for themselves based on the success or failure of them able to spot gems and it's this mm -hmm. gem hunter mentality where the big guys, the whales, they have all the money, they manipulate the market, and we aren't privy to the information that they have. But if we use our brains, we can spot a thing that nobody else has seen and get it cheap, and we will become millionaires in the process. And of course, that, that, that very quickly leads to megalomania and overreach when it comes to the calls that you make, and then you make a bad call. And then, you know, I saw so many people get suckered into you know, investment things where like, oh yeah, I can trade for you on BitMEX because this ability to short the market was like, it was a godlike status. Oh, I can, I can trade the downtrend and still make you money. It's like, oh, this is amazing. So that was 2017, 2021 was no different. I kind of floated all over the top of that because I, I was playing a different game at that point because obviously I was making content and um, working for a company. So my focus was very different, but you saw the same thing with NFTs. It's just, you know, Groups of people who don't know enough but see other people getting rich will act in very dumb ways. And it's not because they are dumb. It's because that's the sort of the echo chamber that they're existing within and everybody else is doing it. So why shouldn't I do it? Uh, which is fascinating. And that can also be a really, really good thing and also be a really, really bad thing. So I'm not necessarily condemning the behavior. It's just uh, at some point, the chicken comes home to roost and it did come home to roost earlier this year in a really spectacular way, <laughs> which, which was wild. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't plan to, to talk about that, but actually we can maybe, maybe continue a bit. So do you want to be a bit more precise? Because that would be probably very interesting for people who are either got burned really bad, either are not really familiar yet with crypto, either think it's a mega scam, either interested to try to understand a bit more how it works under hood in terms of investing, of course. For the moment and so basically who is who is winning who is winning in these situations that you're talking about basically and how much do you actually how much are you actually winning not in terms of quantity of money but like what i what i really realized also uh, big learnings last two three years is a lot of people are lying actually they're even lying about their numbers and everything. And then you might, as you said, there's this echo chamber and you might always think that even if you're doing really well yourself, there's always someone who's doing better and better and better. And then you might end up doing like some really poor decisions just because, because even if you don't want to, you're going to compare yourself to others and feel like you're kind of failure or you're not good enough just because you're listening to all these lies, basically. Yeah, isn't, isn't that the world we live in right now? The, <laughs> the things you see on Instagram are not real. The things you see on TikTok feel a bit more immediate because they're shot you know more shonkily but everything everything is a an illusion is an image that we present to the world i for instance have put a blue and a pink light up behind me today because i think it looks cool so i'm presenting an image to you i have a nice big soft box over here to make everything look better but like i'm 45 years old cannot hide the fact that I look quite young for my age, but at the same time, like this is all carefully stage managed to make me look as good as possible. Um, all of that, you know, that that's that's the that's the truth. I'm not afraid to to put that up there, but what we're talking about here is storytelling. And 
everything is a story that we present to the world through the interface of social media or video content, or whatever we decide to interface with the world. And I think, again, the pandemic has accelerated this, this, the sense of our digital self, our avatar in the world is, is a fiction. And it's very easy for that fiction to get out of control. So for instance, Three Hours Capital presented a fiction to the world on a scale that I think we've rarely seen before. And that fiction eventually was was found out to be what it was, which was a fiction. But of course, if you understand how this game works, everybody who's tweeting what they're saying doesn't necessarily represent their views. And people who are trying to social hack or growth hack will test ideas, theories, types of content religiously until they find the thing that works and then they'll double down and double down and double down. And the problem is when you double down and double down and double down for maximum growth, at some point the well is dry and you can't get there anymore. So you, this is, I mean, so three hours capital is like the, the top end of the spectrum in terms of the story, but at the lower end of the spectrum, we're all telling a story and the story that we're, the audience that we're telling that story to that is the most profound is in fact ourselves. So we paint, you know, if you're if you're poor and suffering because you, know, you haven't got your job or, you know, you don't get out and see your friends, you start to tell this story about yourself, which is could be future facing, which is if I do this, then I can be rich. No, I'm not an idiot. No, I, I actually I really love the Indonesian nose flute. So I'm going to just learn that for the next six months. These are all stories that we tell ourselves and learning to parse out the bullshit that you spin for yourself is a really tough skill because unless you can kind of keep it real and and listen to your own bullshit you're going to get into trouble at some point um i'm very mindful of that in terms of what we do at the defiant it's so easy to become a shell or an echo empty vessel you know beating the drum for the space that we're in and you always have to take a step back and try and understand if people are criticizing you, what is it that they're criticizing? Because it's not personal. None of it's personal, but we always assume that it is personal and it becomes this, oh, it's an attack on me. An attack on this space is an attack on me. An attack on NFTs is an attack on me. And once you let it get personal, then it's it's really hard for it to, to, to untangle all of that and it becomes really toxic. And one of the things that crypto is very good at is creating the illusion of community, this idea that we're all brothers and we're all in this together. And I think that is, again, that's a story. It's a narrative. I think in some cases it's sort of true, but like unless you're employing people, they can just evaporate overnight. And even if you are employing people, they can also do that. So there's no ties for anything. So the community is, is illusory. It's simply a game you play to have some fun. And as long as you treat it as, as that, it's okay. I realize I'm painting a pretty bleak picture here because I actually love this space. I, I have the best time here and I love the conversations that I have. And I love the fact that it's, it's a yes culture over a no culture. It's blissfully naive at times, but of course that naivety can be exploited and that's where we get the scammers coming in. And that, that again is, is the problem. So you, you know, you can't have the naive optimism without people carving it down. So you kind of have to just have your, your wits about you, but um, yeah, everything boils down to storytelling. And I'm going to ask you a question now, because I ask this of every podcast I go on, like, what do you think a story is in your head? What, what is a story? I think it's probably a, it's probably something you you craft to get to an end goal. Interesting, interesting. I ask this question because we all think we know what story is, and yet when you actually ask people to pin it down, uh, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Everybody <laughs> has everybody has a different kind of sense of it because we know how it feels, or we know what it sort of manifests itself as in, in a book or a TV show or everything else, but actually defining story, people find it very, very difficult, which is why, which is why I asked the question, because it's one of the things that gets trotted out as a, as a kind of feature of crypto and of, of social media, everything else. Like, oh yeah, it's just, it's just storytelling. It's this, it's all about the story that our NFT projects, all that story. No, it's about the story you tell in the market, it's the market narrative. It's like, okay, what is a story? uh so you you landed on the bit where it's something you craft for an end result that's that's not bad actually because a story should have an ending 
and you can only really figure out what the story is if you know what the ending is. Um, but I, I simplify it down really to this simple thing, which is it's a setup and a payoff. So you set something up and then you pay it off. And the emotional or otherwise payoff of a story is what makes it fun. And the setup is the bit you described, which is crafting. So there is craft in storytelling and it has a desired effect on the listener, on the receiver of that story. And that, for me, when I think about what story actually is, is breaking down to that setup, payoff. It's two words. That's it. That's enough. Because um, you can you can build all sorts of other things, three act structures, hero's journey, all of these kind of things. But fundamentally, the thing that I look for in storytelling is craft and how it makes me feel. And those two words, setup and payoff, that defines it for me. But trust me when I say I've spent 20 years thinking about this and trying to figure out, and I have books and books and books on my shelf, uh, which have informed my opinion as to what I think story is and, and why it works and how I want to tell the stories that I want to tell. But yeah, it's it's a story is a big thing. And again, when we talk about the creator economy, creators are storytellers, but I guarantee you 99.9% .9 of them, if you pitch them that question, they wouldn't have an answer. Isn't that wild? It is. It is. Uh, so just like, so basically based on that, because again, is that not really related to <laughs> what I wanted to talk about, but it's so interesting because you see, you said before, I'm, I'm painting a, a pretty bleak picture of the space and we're talking about, I think it's really important to get super real. And I've been in the last couple of weeks, let's say the last few months since like the Luna thing happened and then you had all the c stuff and you guys were big. You talked a lot about that. We talked a lot about it too. We're a big believer in the C5. We're a massive believer in Luna, in UST, in Anchor. Like we just loved it. And what's your take, basically? I'd say personally, your take on, on what happened and on ex exactly what you're talking about, about all these crafted narratives that basically serve a purpose, which either it's to bootstrap an ecosystem and with the hope that something's going to get big enough that it's going to become self-sustainable, or maybe we don't even know because we don't know the intention of the people who are behind it to basically build something to enrich themselves and then disappear. And so how should people, to make something really actionable to people who are interested by the space, and obviously if you're interested by the space, you're going to start investing, throw some money on NFTs or throw some money in protocols or tokens. How should people think about what happened this year because it's a massive learning and what you're talking about in, in, in terms of I mean, what you're talking about and what the space is always talking about. Crypto is about narrative investing. It's about narrative investing. It's about narrative investing. What should people be really, really, really careful about when they approach the space to, not, to minimize the chances to get screwed, basically? Yeah. Well, I don't think Do Kwon ever set out to be a scammer. It's possible that he was leaning that way before UST set up, but it, there are. It's it's very easy to say there are too many smart people connected to that and talking to them, for it to obviously be a scam, but it's entirely possible that <clears throat> that Doquan was just a silver-tongued snake oil salesman of the highest order, and certainly there's evidence to suggest that he was. And still is. As I read the papers this morning, there's an Interpol red notice out for Do Kwan. He is yeah. out there somewhere. So I first came into contact with Anchor before it even launched. I was looking at fixed interest rates in DeFi because variable interest rates were not the product that I thought you know, the mass audience would gravitate towards. They'd be looking at fixed rate of, rates of interest. So I discovered Anchor, saw the white paper, and it called itself the benchmark interest rate for yeah. DeFi. And so you're looking at this thinking 20%, is that possible? Okay. And then it launched and it was possible. And it was possible in this fertile ground of DeFi experimentation, which was like, you know, that gave birth to the curve token, that gave birth to comp and the balancer token. And of course, Wi-Fi, the, you know, the token of Yearn, where just simply using the galaxy brain of Andre Cronier and then other galaxy brains like Banteg plugged in as well, you had a product that really, really seemed to work. And so UST came out of that 
And then there was, of course, USDT. And USDT is one of the reasons why UST blew up. And it's, it's hard to overstate that, but USDT has forever been seen as just deeply problematic. And so this idea of a crypto native algorithmic stable coin that could rival USDT was, was just rich. It was so, so rich. And people looked at the terror ecosystem. They looked at the South Korean narrative, the Chai payment app with all the, you know, the, the money that was funneling through that and just thought, actually, this could work. And if there hadn't been the Chai payments app, I don't think they would have looked at it in the same way. But there was this idea tickling along underneath it that there are, there are real transactions happening here with a community in South Korea that is using this thing daily. And therefore, that can probably scale. And I, I think if that hadn't been there, I don't think anybody would have looked at it. But what happened, of course, was if there's a good thing going, then the whales sweep in and they just rinse it. They absolutely rinse it. So and that, that's entirely what happened. So you have huge players coming in, depositing large amounts of UST and reaping 20% on that. Uh, it, it just wasn't sustainable. And there didn't seem to be any plan for how to move beyond that. And then, of course, we got into this situation where Doe becomes increasingly belligerent on Twitter, becomes increasingly like an authoritarian dictator, you know, beating down all FUD and refusing to listen to anything. And there is, there's a red flag that pops up when that happens. But again, when you looked at what was going on, there were so many respected and respectable players who were saying good things about terror and were bullish on terror that it became very, very difficult to see the other side of it, uh, to take the contrarian view. And I think we're all complicit in that. You know, you had the team at Delphi Digital. They were all in on Terra. Yeah. I, I think I hold those guys in very high regard, but they fucked up there. They did. Uh, they they were taken in by, by Doe. And look, this is not the first time this has happened. Look at um, Adam Newman, WeWork. You know, he... <laughs> He managed to dupe the head of you know one of the most respected investment entities in SoftBank in the world, yeah. Massa, and 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 you know to the tunes of billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. You know it is entirely possible when you have this information asymmetry to keep the fiction going for way longer than you would have thought. And so, so the second part of your question: how do how do you tread safe in this space? Well, there's I. I think, I think honestly, it's it's a little bit like the UFC. You you can train MMA like Mark Zuckerberg does, and that will get you a certain level of fitness and awareness and understanding. But it will not prepare you for just getting beat down in the ring and taking a freak shot that just knocks you out. And I think the only way to truly be safe in this space is to have been beaten up a bit. Because then you learn to kind of understand your own behaviors. You, you learn to understand what a scammer looks like and how they might work on you. And, and also your, your own worst impulses when it comes to, to money. Because you might be perfectly rational nine days out of 10, but one day you might just get to work and go, fuck it. And then that moment, you are vulnerable. And we all suffer from that. And there's no shame in that at all. But you need to feel the pain of, oh dear, I messed up here. I screwed up bad before you can start to really understand how this space works on you. And so, you know, when people say only bet what you're willing to lose, I think that's go into it, assuming that you will lose at some point and be okay with that and take that as part of the learning process. Because if you're envious of people who are making massive gains in the market, they also screwed up. Yeah. And it also is entirely possible that the amount that they've earned or won or gained has to be balanced by the amount that they lost as well, which is probably significant. And they'll take big big losses as well as big wins. So you you have to go in with that mindset that is, I'm, I'm ready, you know, the price of winning big in this space is cuts and bruises and maybe limping around for a bit. And then the second thing is, I guess I I try and live by kind of a few key principles. I don't know if I would manage to live up to them every day, but they're, they're kind of things that I, I think about all the time. And they, they look like this. First one is keep it real. 
I I think that's so important in this space is like call bullshit when something's bullshit. And if you if the person you're calling bullshit on is prepared to laugh and go, you know what, you're right, that is bullshit, and have a conversation with you about it, then that's awesome. And they are somebody you can ha- you can you you can genuinely look forward to hearing where they develop and grow into. But if they put the walls up and and fight back, then you got a problem. Um, the second one is challenge all assumptions. So we we work, in, you know, in a, in a framework of ideas and theses in crypto, in investing, in everything really, and those are important because they construct a theory of everything, but they start to become assumptions. So assuming this, then this must be true. And assuming this, um, assuming that Putin will not invade Ukraine. Uh, well, that was a wrong assumption, wasn't it? And look where we are now. Assuming that UST is what it says it is. Well, that was a wrong assumption as well. But a lot of people built businesses and huge amounts of wealth and risk on that assumption, and it was proven to be wrong. So there's no harm in simply doing two things, run towards those who disagree with you and then yeah. take the opposite position. Like, what if I'm wrong? And that that takes an enormous amount of confidence to say, you know what, I could be wrong. I could entirely be wrong. And so if I am wrong, then I want to hear from the people who are telling me that I'm wrong because the people who are telling me I'm right have, there's absolutely no value to that whatsoever. And I think it's a very difficult thing for for human beings in in this era to hear because we want to be perfect and we want to be we want to be infallible we want the face we present to the world to be perfect and hearing that you're not perfect and that you're wrong can be hard to hear criticism can be hard to hear but it's also a thing that if you i mean if you spend a lot of time in the creative industries like i have you start to you start to get good at receiving criticism and particularly bad criticism and they always talk about the note beneath the note. What is someone tells you something, but that's not really what they they mean. Um, they might go, I don't like the music, but actually what they mean is it's too slow for me. Uh, things like that. Uh, mm. You know, you get all sorts of weird and wonderful criticism, but learning to parse out the note beneath the note is really important. But for me, criticism is massively important because if there's something that I can improve, well, God damn it, I'm going to, I'm, I want to improve it. And like, I would, I will take any, like, like this doesn't work. This doesn't work. Okay, cool. Then I can make it better rather than, well, why, what, what, of course it works. Of course it works. How how dare you tell me it doesn't work? It's like, all right, you tell me it doesn't work. That's interesting. What can I learn from this and how can I improve things? And if you take that mindset, then all criticism, some suddenly becomes this massive positive force. And you can simply sit above it and go, given my trust in my own faculties, can I look at this criticism and decide what's good and what's bad? And if there's stuff that's good, I can action it and make things better overall. That's really good. But like, I don't think most people are wired up that way, or at least they haven't trained themselves to be wired up that way. Uh, Cause it's painful at times. Mm. So I think it's really interesting. The comparison you're making between being a creative person and actually this investing thing in crypto, where you should basically look for the, I guess people who have like really different opinion from you. The only difference, and I think it's pretty big, and I would even ask you how you would deal with that is in investing in this kind of weird crypto world that is where we know a lot of things. We know in the business world, people lie a lot. I mean, they sell, so they kind of like yeah. change. It real lies, I don't know, but like they kind of lie to sell. In crypto, it's this, but 10x. <laughs> And then you see basically the, um, these big entities with these super smart people, at least people who look smart. 3AC was the perfect example. We talked about it before. And then you see all these people who are in the game and who are supporting your bias. So you have the cognitive bias. You're just thinking like, oh, uh, uh, I'm right. I'm amazing. But even if you make the superhuman effort to go and look at the people who are against your opinion, where do you stop? Because you can become, on the other hand, after what happened this year is a great example. You can really, if you, even if you stay around and you still want to invest, you can really become kind of paranoid or have what everybody calls P, P, PTSD, you know? And, and at some point, there is, at some point you need to still, if you want to make it, like you said, you need bruises, get punched in the face, but you still need to keep at it. And like, how do you, you know, I think a lot of people could go from, 
kind of being naive, which enabled them to make massive gains, but then lost everything or pretty much everything, to becoming so stressed out that you are basically having this um, par paralysis by analysis or trying to like prove yourself wrong on everything. And where is where is basically the balance after things that happen? Like and you yeah. Know, Wait, isn't that, isn't that the thing? You stare at the chart and you live every tick and you you beat yourself up over every up or down movement. And some people, some people are okay at living in that, in that state where they're kind of going through it. Oh God, it's up, it's down. Oh shit. Um, yeah, I, I think you just got to, you got to take a look at yourself really and think about like, what is, what am I in this for? Because, you know, taking repeated losses over and over and over will beat anyone down. And particularly if you overinvested in a late stage market, you're going to get punished so hard. And there isn't really anybody around to tell you, listen, this is a market and it has cycles. And in, you know, if everything follows the same plan as last time, in four years time, you're going to look like a genius. So just sit tight, walk away, and you'll be fine. Nobody can really explain to you what that is and what that looks like until you've been through it once and you go, okay, uh, all right, this is fine. But of course, now we have this broader macro narrative that is starting to lead to the idea that maybe this time it's different. And we've heard this time it's different over and over and over. Many times. <laughs> over. This time it's different. This time the institutions are coming. This time we have an ETF. This time it's going to be my grandmother who's opened up a Bitcoin ATM. No. Um, and, and every time you just go, no, it's not different. It's exactly the same. It's exactly yeah. the same every single time. And I, I, I'm happy to be proven wrong, but actually I, every time I look at this, it's like, no, it's, it's the exact same thing every single time. And that's because human beings as a group are the same every single time. So to your point, to your question, how do how does anyone come into the space, tread sensibly and carefully and, and make good decisions? I yeah. wish I knew. <laughs> I wish I knew because you have to make bad decisions. You have to get lucky because getting lucky and having a good moment is what starts the obsession with the space and what it can be and where it can go. And there is, I guess the problem is that it's, on the, on the one hand, it presents as this future alternative financial system. But really, it's a video game. You know, you <laughs> you dig down these rabbit holes and you start to understand financial engineering, and you go, "Wow, that's really exciting! I never knew I could do that with my money." And then you go, "Boy, but this, but the, oh, shit coins! Shit coins are really fun. This project." And then you start becoming an expert in research. And you go, "Oh yeah, yeah. Look, the CEO was uh, at one point in a boat with Elon Musk. Therefore, yeah, no, probably this can be really, really good. That one." Um, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it on Twitter and then you start building friends on Twitter and then suddenly you've got a friend base that you never thought you had before. And now you're a social media influencer and it's like, Oh, this is fun. Like, what has that got to do with investing? Nothing. So any kind of solid investor will say, yes, well, you have to look at the fundamentals, sir. So you look at the fundamentals in crypto and there aren't any fundamentals. If anyone starts talking about fundamentals, they haven't got a clue what they're talking about. And then they start talking about technicals. Nope. That doesn't work either. So what, what is it? Oh, yeah, that's right. It's the story again. And I think that's why, of all things, someone from my background that does what I do has, like, and I think filmmakers in general, because we're massively impulsive and take huge gambles and things, but we're also storytellers, have really gravitated towards this space because it feels so very, very familiar. It's all a great big Shakespearean drama. But like, the yeah, fundamentals don't add up. No one's really making any genuine money here like i mean so, sort of yes you can you can you can take that analysis but really it's just pure speculation and therefore it's it's about the story so if you're comfortable with that and you're in for the soap opera of it all great but if you want a more solid investment there are there are other places to invest in and i i always prickle when people say oh i'm an investor and as your investor you should be doing this for me i'm like you're not you're a speculator own it that's it you know, if you're an investor, this would be a very different conversation and uh, we'd be all in jail. So, yeah, speculators is what we are. So basically, would you say that crypto is that kind of, I mean, on one hand, you might say this is kind of, this is, this is potentially the future of 
the internet infrastructure in a very long time and so on and so forth. At least it's a narrative again that's being talked about. But if you read, I mean, if you, if you, the, the really interesting about crypto is like understanding, it helps you understand money, Bitcoin, what's sound money, what's not sound, what, what are potential issues with the, with the fiat currency system. But then the problem is like, you might end up being so religious about it that you might say, USD is shit, USD is shit. And then you might, you might hold, or hold all your coins and then you get wrecked. And now you see USD is the strongest thing ever, like at least right now. And so, yeah. we, so, so there is all these narratives, but will you say that, to, because I think to, to, try, to try to extract some value out of this, some financial value of those, these markets, you need to be very, you, you can think this is the future. I, I'm really, I really believe in the technology, the blockchain is really interesting, et cetera. But you need to stay really, uh, you need to have zero emotions, basically, and almost say, this is one thing I think about that, but it has nothing to do with my investment or speculation in the activity in the field, which is much more, there, there's these cycles. It's basically because anyone can access to this stuff. It's like basically a gigantic casino that's open 24 seven that follows market cycles. And if I'm kind of able to understand that, and things repeat one way or another all over and over again. And I'm able to detach myself from my emotions when everybody's going crazy about that. That's where I'm going to be able to basically extract value. And these are the expense of the others who basically arrived later in the cycle and get destroyed, like completely destroyed. Because as we saw this year, the really sad thing that happened is you can do all the right thing. You can say, I'm going to buy just Bitcoin, just buy ETH, because they're like the kind of two things that have like, some interesting use cases and some adoption. And I'm not going to sell them because I can't out-trade the market. Blah, blah, blah. This is another, another topic, but in traditional investing, you can't out-trade the market for a very long period of time. I mean, over a very long period of time. So you might say, I'm just going to follow, I'm not going to follow this space too much. It's too, it's too complicated to understand. I'm just going to buy Bitcoin and ETH and save, basically keep them safely. But you know, buying a ledger or cold wallet. Oh, I don't know what this is. Like I'm from the normal world. Like I'm just going to keep them on one of these crypto banks that is safe. That weighs billions or hundreds of millions from like pension funds or whatever. And you get destroyed. Like even doing the right things. So like, again, even the, the long-term kind of, I mean, you said fundamental in, investing is, is kind of a meme. But even if you say, I want to bet on these two main crypto assets, one, because... It's kind of digital gold. The other, and it's basically decentralized. And the other is basically where stuff is being built, even if it's a lot of shit. You can do that and still get destroyed. So that my, my main analysis this year was, if this is what happens, yeah, people should keep their stuff on their ledger, but then you forget the yield and all that stuff. That is also a very important component about the reason why a bunch of us are in the space. Maybe it's another narrative, of course, but like, if you think it that way and even doing most of the right things, you still get to lose most of your money. How do you see these markets, except than a four year cycle casino that you should just say, when everybody's depressed, I invest. When we reach previous all time highs, most of the gains are in, kind of safe gains are in, provided I found the assets that are basically getting I back to previous all time highs. So, yeah, so you raise a couple of interesting points there. What is right? That is, 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 is a hard one to parse because we've been taught that putting your money in the bank is the right thing to do. Crypto says, don't do that. Crypto says, you're not your keys, not your coins. So fundamentally, parking your funds in a pseudo bank uh, is the wrong thing to do. So I would argue that that wasn't the right thing to do in the first place. And, and yet that was kind of held up as this safe way of accessing staking and yields and all these kind of things, but it was, it was bollocks. Um, and I, and I think it's, they had such nice websites like BlockFi had a nice website. It kind of looked friendly and looked right. It looked like a banking institution. It looked correct. But of course it wasn't, but we didn't know what was going on there. And the thing is, you don't know what ING or 
ABN AMRO is doing or HSBC is doing with your money. You just kind of hope that it's doing the right thing. But there's no reason why the same similar kind of thing couldn't happen with those big banks. Of course, there's provisions in place to ensure that that doesn't happen. But you're right that like doing the right thing was the wrong thing in this instance. And people got wrecked as a result of that. You also brought up this idea of religion and coins becoming pseudo religions. And that, that really is an issue for me. We hold up these lead developers like they're some kind of messiah. Like the imagery around Andre Cronier was of him literally as a messiah of Sergei Nazarov at Link. It's like they held up like these messiahs. They have all the answers and it's deeply problematic. Um, there's just this need for strong leadership and people with strong ideas because the space is so difficult to navigate when someone is there holding up a big sign saying, I know what's going on. You're like, oh my God, thank God. Finally, I can just sit tight and go, yeah, I got it right. And that's, again, where we have to challenge the assumptions. And once you get comfortable, you have to give yourself a kick because if you're comfortable, then you're probably going to get burned. And I think that's, again, that's one of the things that is so difficult about this space. Like the, 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 the best place to be in is, is where you are uncomfortable and you are making mistakes and doing the wrong thing, because you will see people around you who do the wrong thing and enjoy massive gains off the back of it. Cause they're willing to take those risks. That could be so hard. And like we also talked about like just putting your Bitcoin and Ether in, in, in a place and sitting tight and not doing anything with it. It's boring as hell. Like trading, trading like just off charts, boring as hell. Like just sitting there waiting for an entry. Six hours go by, no entry. Another six hours go by, no entry. You get up, yep, still no entry. That's so boring. Like trading in general is quite boring. And then suddenly you get bang. Um, some people get bored. And just sitting on something that, you know, has seen most of its kind of exciting growth period, you know, in the rear view mirror, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, like, is that exciting for people? No, we all want some excitement in our lives. And again, you talked about it being a casino. It's exactly like a casino. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it it's, it's what, what game are you up for, you know? What what are what are you what are you willing to step in the ring for? Um, because if it's financial freedom you're after, there are other ways to get that, and that is just to live slightly less kind of uh, luxuriously than you do normally for a really long time, and then you'll have financial freedom. It's really not that difficult. Um, I don't know if you follow the fire movement, financially independent retirement. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you you know I watch videos from people who our proponents for that and they're all like it's like you're not happy <laughs> you're not happy the amount of sacrifice you've had to put in to get there i don't believe it um so i don't know like living a little along the way is 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 something but i know you keep asking me for like how do people stay safe and i i just think you've got to be you've got to be really capable of looking at yourself in the mirror and saying i'm wrong and being okay with that and then just doing a, a lot of homework and talking to as many different people as you possibly can to get different opinions because there's it's so easy to fall into the trap of getting comfortable in a in a group or a chat and those chats so rapidly become echo chambers particularly if you're in a trading group someone will kind of launch in with a very strong opinion about a, a token and then it just infects the group and anyone with a contrary opinion and this is the really horrible thing that happens is brigading where people just get hounded out of a group for having a an opposing opinion and so yeah it's it's just not it's not a healthy environment really for for financially motivated decision making i don't think yeah. okay so we talked a lot about the kind of bad about the industry so what excites you and what because you said before you love the industry you love you you research a lot you cover it with by doing amazing videos so what what really excites you about this industry and we can talk about i mean we can talk about obviously the creator economy the potential in web3 uh but other stuff basically that you think or that excites you 
So these these periods of the market where we go through these these bear cycles historically have been where the next kind of great exciting idea springs from or the iteration of an idea springs from because we we had nfts in 2017 in the shape of crypto kitties and it sort of took off but then sort of died but there was definitely something there and then it sparked a kind of resurgence in digital art and all these other fun things with nfts and gave us the pfp craze mania thing and i'm i'm still very excited about what pfps could be i don't think we're anywhere near tapping the full potential of those as an idea as communities as things that can be really scaled up into something culturally significant that's exciting for me of course there's a lot of garbage that's come alongside it but uh if you if you look at the creative legacy of of like the very top projects in the space it's really interesting and i wouldn't necessarily say that board apes has had a kind of over overtly positive effect on the space but you cannot deny that they've changed it uh, as a result of, of what they managed to accomplish in the last 18 months that was really exciting on a DeFi level the things that get me excited <laughs> tend to be like really weird things so like alchemix and loans that pay themselves back that i i love that and I don't know how feasible that is at scale, but I still find that a really compelling piece of kind of DeFi magic. I love that. I also love things like structured products. So junior and senior tranches in, in DeFi where you can mitigate uh, yield volatility and, and offset that. So you can take a junior position or a senior position. I think that, I mean, that's not even a particularly radical thing, but that as, as a way of using tokens correctly for splitting up something that would otherwise not function the way you would want it to I think that's really great but again those things don't work unless you have takers on both sides of the aisle so you need people taking the junior side and the senior side and then it works that's really cool though um i i love the way that DeFi can spin these ideas up and and tokenize them and turn them into something where traditional financial instruments can be um can be done in a, in a DeFi way I think uh, I'm not excited by CDBCs from a philosophical perspective, but I am excited by them in terms of the way the entire world's economy is going to move away from cash. From like the from the journalistic perspective, the death of cash is that's pretty wild, and how CDBCs are going to be implemented, how we're going to be how they're going to be surveilled how they're going to be implemented and, and used globally, whether we're going to see a digital euro, a digital dollar. These are big, big, big things. And, and they have huge ramifications for how like the entire financial system is going to be arranged. Um, that's a big story. So I'm kind of excited about that to see how that's going to play out. I'm excited to see what happens with Doquan. It is like they, there's going to be a Netflix film about that for sure, for sure. Um, I'm also, I'm also still like, I'm bullish on the space. Like, there's so much has happened in the last four years that is net positive, genuinely, um, and has had knock-on effects. That I don't think we even realize yet. But people, you know, from a, coming out of the the pandemic and realizing that they can they can find an audience for a thing that they loved and were passionate about, and and actually make some money out of it. That was that was encouraging. And it's still there. It hasn't gone away. It's just a bit harder now. Um, and again, you know, this the battle that we're in right now for meaningful regulation around crypto, <clears throat> it means that crypto is in is in the mainstream field of view now, irrevocably. And it needs to be dealt with. And the SEC weirdly have targeted DeFi as the kind of preeminent threat. They never saw Bitcoin as so much of a threat, but DeFi, for some reason, that seems to be the place where they're like, oh, shit, we need to do something about this. Obviously, UST was a big part in that, but where that regulation goes, it, I mean, it's probably going to end up being something that we all kind of go, okay, I can live with that. I can live mm -hmm. with that. Um, so being in that place where we have a bit of clarity, that's something to look forward to, but it's going to take time. 2023 is probably going to be the year where we see the the first proper meaningful kind of actionable legislation and regulatory framework but i wouldn't say that that was by any stretch 
the end of it. But 2023 is going to be it's going to be a difficult year for the whole space anyway. I wouldn't expect the bull to resume in 2023. But 2024, you never know. We might be back. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, if you're expecting, oh, don't worry, it's going to be Christmas. It's going to be brilliant <laughs> this year. Oh, Bitcoin, 100K. Nah, sorry. I'm, I don't make those kind of predictions. I think what's really interesting to see is, despite all the negativity now, kind of deep depression. I mean, are we even in the depressed part of the cycle? Probably not, because people still have a lot of hope, it seems. But if you look back four years ago, 2018, 2019, like there was so much, so much less to be excited about. And yet, right? It just came back, and we're still much higher than before. But do you remember um, how it came back? It came back because of DeFi. There was just this thing that came out of nowhere. And I, we, we knew about DeFi. We knew it was a thing 2018. It was just starting to kind of, like, with Maker and Dai. <clears throat> this is this, it was so niche. It was just like, oh, you have a lot of ETH, and you took a loan out and Dai. Well, good for you. Nice one. And, like, nobody gave a crap about DeFi and then poof, yield farming. 2020, yeah. And that, that just blew up. And because people needed a game to play, they were just they were like, I need to do something. And then suddenly this, this brand new narrative sprang up. And that that's that new thing is being born right now. You just gotta listen out for it and see where it is. But it, it's out there. I have a pretty I have a pretty firm idea of what I think it is or where it's gonna come from, but I'm not gonna tell you. Um because I would look like an idiot, but uh, it, no, I'm, I'm, I, it, it's out there. There's, there's a narrative that's already in play, and everyone's going, "Oh my god, this is just such garbage." But it, I think that's going to be where the next big kind of juiciness comes from. And somewhere out there is, is, is something new is being is being built or designed, or an, a new idea is is being hatched right now, and we'll see it next year. Um, that'd be really cool for a bit. But yeah, it was DeFi 2020, and then. So towards the end of 2020, it all started to filter into shit coins again, which was, you know, where it all, all picked up in 2021. We know what happened. But it's amazing how kind of short a period of time that actually was. It wasn't that long. No, it was not. It seems like a very long one, but it was not. No, it wasn't. And you can easily miss it. So if you're kind of sticking around for the next couple of years, you know, just keep your ear to the ground. Also, if you are in it now, like you small investments or small deposits or small purchases in in crypto can pay off really big if you if you do it sensibly so you can dca into bitcoin and ethereum and like you know the levels that bitcoin is at right now and that ether are at right now they're fairly favorable the the risk reward is not that bad like if you can accept a 50 percent drawdown which could potentially happen then you know what happens on the other side of that could be good and then you just dca and Bob's your uncle. Uh, but that, you know, that's just very rational thinking about the probabilities of where this market is going to go. So basically the take the, the, the takeaway from like this, from this is, and from what we talked about before is there's these cycles and no matter how much we might think when it's going up or when it's going down, that this time is different. There is macro, there is super cycle. There is a oh war. Don't Whatever. Ever say super cycle. At, at the end of the day, there is just these cycles, and there is always going to, to be something. 2020 was DeFi. There's always going to be something that's going to kind of reignite the, the fire and, and make the next cycle happen. And it's going to probably look fairly similar to what happened before. And, 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 and looking back, we're, we're probably going to be like, oh man, like, playing the kind of stupid four-year cycle, like as dumb as it might seem, like is actually, is it uh, the, the, the best uh, maximizing strategy? Probably not, but is it like uh, decent? Probably, if you think like a bit yeah. dumbly about the, the, the cycle. Well, it, the, the thing is that there's very few facts in crypto. There's a lot of fiction in crypto, but one fact is the halving. It is a fact. Yeah. And because of that, you can kind of hang a lot of thinking on that. And historically, it, it is proven to be the case. Now, the halving happens, and then the market doesn't just instantly go up. It takes a long time for that to settle in and for the new 
paradigm and the shape of things to play out. I mean, of course, we can't do this show without talking about the merge and the new narrative there. But of course, that has happened successfully. Now we're in proof of stake. I'm trying to remember what I, I had a, a, a stream with a, a company called Securrency, and they're building institutional rails for big clients to come in and, and participate in ETH 2.0. And what he was saying was, there's a massive amount of interest. There's a massive amount of excitement about um, this ETH 2.0 staking as a as a kind of basically a pseudo bond. I'm like, well, yeah, we, we can just take this and get this this very exciting yield on this product. And as long as the custody is set up correctly, then we we good. I'm like, well, um, well, you know, the thing that people are always worried about is, oh, is it a security? But what if what if ETH 2.0 is a security? It's like if you're an institution, you don't give a shit. Like security or not. If it's a security, great. Great if it's a security. You can just you can just trade this thing easy peasy. It's all regulated and it's a framework that you understand. Security is not a problem. So security, or ETH being a security is is thrown up as like a, a massive issue. But for an institution, they don't give a shit either way. They just want regulatory clarity. And if that's what where it goes, great. They're already set up for that. All good. And then what what you're missing is exchanges to manage crypto securities which just doesn't exist yet and that's always been one of the, the stumbling blocks for crypto securities or tokens that are set up as securities it's just very 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 cumbersome and very lengthy to get any kind of clarity on whether they are or they aren't i would also just find a place where you can actually trade them freely and securely so that all of that is coming i think uh but for the for the retail investor you'll that has nothing to do with you anyway. So you're probably going to be back with your NFTs or your shit coins or wherever you find, you know, the most hope for the spectacular gains that you've heard all your friends getting. So if we so if we do a little exercise now and we apply what we talked about before to what you just said, you're talking to this company, they're very excited about themselves talking to institutions that say they have a massive interest about this yield that Raul Pal, who says this is the benchmark yield for crypto and, and all that stuff. How do you, knowing how people are, it's really important to be optimistic. Raul is over optimistic about, which is great for the long term of the space. But, but again, how do you apply what we talked about before, which is, oh, that's amazing. I'm so excited, but I'll take a step back see how can i basically be sure that these you know these institutions are so excited but is excited is excitement a word is it gonna happen in three months six months five years yeah it's exciting it's exciting a lot of people are excited about a lot of things uh if you do business and you you do sales you see people are very excited but most of the time it doesn't result into anything how do you basically apply this kind of mindset that is probably what we talked about today, very useful to people to less a bit to be a bit less burnt to the information that you get in crypto that is always so optimistic, you know. So you do, yeah. so you can maybe uh, protect well, you, yourself. You, you brought up you brought up Raul, and unfortunately, I've I've had a number of interactions with Raul both on and off air, and I've gotten to know him pretty well. And and Raul is you're you're right. He's he's a little bit like me. He's you know he's a well-spoken english man and you know he when he yeah. says stuff you you listen because he's english and he i seem to remember at the end of 2021 tweeted out i've taken an irresponsibly large position in eth he kind of drank, yeah he drank the kool-aid on eth and said wow and yeah that's not very helpful um david hoffman from bankless does the same thing so he tweeted out yeah, uh, ETH at 1300 is, is the greatest crypto I saw that. trade I saw that. of all time. Yeah. And I'm like, David, don't do that. No. <laughs> because that is this just dumb. Firstly, you don't know that. Secondly, if you're wrong, you look like an idiot. You have a brand in which you are creating this, this sense of financial you know, understanding and, and intelligence. <clears throat> Someone who sits behind that doesn't say things like that because it's dumb. And so <clears throat> I look at that and go, you've just drunk your own bullshit. 
which is a horrible thing to say. It's a full bullshit milkshake and you're just, you know, he's all over your face. Raoul's done the same thing. And it's just really easy to get carried away in the moment and start saying things that because you want to believe it and therefore you put it out there and you want other people to believe it. It's very easy to spot those things when they've happened. Um, it's just comfort food for influencers. Like put a tweet out and get a nice bunch of responses back going, yeah, you're right. That's how I feel too. Awesome. We're the same. Bullshit. All of it. Um, so I think when it comes to things like Ethereum, there's a ton of documentation and there's a ton of writing about Ethereum. So it's really, really, really straightforward to get contrasting opinions about it. Um, also, right now, if you are thinking of investing in this space, I mean, you've got, firstly, you've got tons of time because the market will be like sideways or weird for quite a long time. So you've got time to think, figure this out and to take a good position. If you are a smart investor and you're like building your position slowly over time, this is great. Um, mm. if, if you are indeed wrong, you'll have time because again, the re regulatory things, they move really slowly and it gets flagged and signaled really quickly. Also, we know now that this, the Fed's movements around reducing inflation are going to go on for quite a long time. So crypto is not going to move while that is kind of putting pressure on everything the way it is at the moment. So you've got time. So yeah, do the homework and listen to people who are not Raoul Pal. Listen to Nouriel Rubini. What does Nouriel Rubini say about? Oh. Yeah, that's a good one, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, because we're we all thinking like, oh, shut up, shut up. I don't want to hear about this guy. He's old school, blah, blah, blah. But uh, he's but the thing is, he's a dickhead and he's a, he's a troll. But underneath it all is a is a is a is like a framework of thinking that fundamentally isn't wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it's contrarian and he comes across sounding like an angry old man. But like if you spend the time and listen to what he actually has to say, it's not like his opinions formed from just newspaper headlines. He, he knows his shit. Um, but also, when we think about what crypto is about, it's like, know your audience. The young people of today refuse to play by these same rules and are just going to go and follow the rules that they want. So it's like those who are trying to preserve the French language. You know, you have this uh, august institution in Paris that's saying the French language is this, and we must not change it. We must not debase the French language. We must not have um, English language songs on French radio because the French youth will not have it. It's like, well, they're going to do what they want to do, mate. Um, so if the French language is going to be debased, it's going to be debased. You can't hold that back. And it's the same with the financial system. It's going to get debased in some way, shape or form. And I think that's where we start to see the really radical ideas pop up. And if you think about um, the sovereign individual and things like Balaji's network state, at the moment, you think about the borders of countries and how they're set up and how restrictive they can be. And then you think about the metaverse and what people are going to be like in the metaverse. You're like It's not that big of a stretch to imagine that a network state could emerge in the metaverse, which could then be accepted into the United Nations. That's kind of Balaji's big vision of this. Like There's a, a distributed network of individuals um, united around collective action for a single cause, whatever it might be, that can then kind of turn themselves into a quasi country. This is wild. Yeah. This is the stuff I love. This is because I, I see that could genuinely happen. And, you know, we, I, I come from this creator economy kind of thinking space. But like, if you think about Mr. Beast, over 100 million subscribers, the power in his hand to organize people and to get them to do things and to, to, to speak to them on a scale that you know very few leaders in the world can can do well why couldn't he set up a network state that would be that would be something to oh, see I mean, yeah you know and it's, it's it's a bunch of degenerate gen alphas aping into stuff and that's that's the state thing why is that why can that not be recognized it's wild so fun times yeah yeah, you mentioned Rubini, and it directly made me think about Taleb also, who's who's been yeah. very vocal and critical about Bitcoin. And or Peter Schiff, you yeah. know, like the, the problem we have is like for every Peter Schiff, there's a Michael Saylor. And Michael Saylor is like some at some point he just he went loco, he went totally loco. Yeah, I wanted to ask what, what, what do you think about him? Basically, what do you think about this? Because on one hand, 
pretty funny when you're in this, I'd say, I mean, not even bull market, even before, if you really read about Bitcoin literature, Austrian economics, it makes so much sense. But for everything that makes so much sense, there is also some other things that make sense in another word or another way of thinking. And, um, and so you might just think, oh, the guy's a genius. And like, but it, if you look at what happened, uh, there, is, there, was the, there was also the, another narrative. There was the corporate by Bitcoin narrative, which was, the, and the, 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 the government, you know, use Bitcoin for everything narrative. And like, he's kind of alone out there and still like mega believer. And, and yeah, like, what do you think of a person who is, Is it, is, it our, is it our emotions that are playing us now saying the guy is crazy when we would think before the guy really got it and has big balls? Or is he just really crazy, basically? And he just doesn't realize the risk? I don't think he's crazy. I think he's, he's obstinate. And it also bear in mind where this came from because the, the, the money printer goes brr meme it was a real thing like the, the u.s yeah. government the fed printed a lot of extra dollars and that those dollars flooded the world and we bought a bunch of stuff with them uh but that's now what we have inflation and now we're trying to solve inflation but fundamentally it was the, deb the debasement of the u.s dollar and that was what michael saylor was planting his flag against saying i refuse to capitulate to this and therefore i'm going to put my money into bitcoin instead the problem is that <clears throat> what you tend to see is people ridiculing people like michael saylor whoever who's who's visibly and audibly in favor of pro bitcoin and so they retrench and then they start saying more and more outrageous things to to keep their base happy because you know this mm. is the big bet that they've made and of course he keeps buying bitcoin naive bekele same thing keeps buying bitcoin not on the same scale as Sailor, of course. <clears throat> I just think there's the there's pub there's the public version of this, and also Sailor just refuses to countenance the idea that anything other than Bitcoin is valid, uh, which is again this big Bitcoin maximalist way of seeing the world. I, I find problematic, but it, but also necessary. Uh, so I don't think he's crazy. I just think he's exhibiting the same symptoms of blinkered thinking that a lot of people in this space exhibit and i don't think it's where they naturally come from it i think it's just a natural it's what happens when people attack you the whole time and so if you are kind of nervous about your position or you you, you bolster your own opinions by being overtly aggressive about it publicly um and that comes from probably a lack of confidence honestly um, but he's doubled down and doubled down and doubled down and, and probably it'll all turn out okay in the end. But um, mm -hmm. it's like all of these things, like the crypto cycle is just so brutal that you've got to endure three, four months, three, four years of horrible pain and negativity and people calling you an idiot to reap the rewards of that. The question is, what will Michael Saylor do when, if Bitcoin goes on another run then it goes up to 100,000 or 150,000 will sailors start selling because the rational thing to do is to cut you, you know is, is to take your winners and bank them but what is he going to bank them to if his if his narrative is the US dollar is de debased then where how does he make that real or does he say no I'm just going to hold on to it and then watch the whole thing collapse again it, it's a very it's a very interesting discussion to be had uh, but I don't think he's crazy. No, I just think he's he's trapped himself in a narrative that he's now got to just live with and own it. So he's owning it in the way that he thinks is correct, and he just looks like a, a nut job now. Okay. So would you say that, just linked to what you said now, would you say that the because there's this entire hodl meme and narrative, which is basically you need to hodl. That's how you're going to make the best gains and everything. Like, so you would say basically this is not the most rational thing to do. Once yeah, you so went at so least through a cycle where you got destroyed, obviously. Yeah, so I have a. I've always had a problem with HODL because if you if you live in an economic system and that system doesn't spend the money that it makes, 
the economy grinds to a halt. And so HODL is fundamentally stupid in my book because you want people to spend. So if people just took all the dollars that they earned or the, the, the euros that they earned, put them in the bank, or even worse, put them under the mattress and didn't do anything with them, then the economy will simply cease. It will just grind to a halt. So Bitcoin being hodled isn't a great advert for its economic viability. That's always the thing I've had an issue with with HODL. And the, the second thing is the point of this whole experiment is to give people financial freedom. Freedom implies agency in your decision-making processes. It implies that you have the freedom to decide which way you go, left or right, up or down. Hodling as an idea is inherently passive. Now, of course, it is a decision that you make to do something. Inaction is as much an action as you know selling or whatever else. But it's so passive that it reinforces the idea that if I do nothing, then I'm okay. Whereas my feeling is that a workforce that sits on its hands and doesn't act, well, that's that's no good to me. I, if someone came into my office and said, I'm just hodling today. So, oh, is that what you're doing? Well, I'd fire them. So why would I want that mentality? Why would I want that meme in an economic system that I think is designed for the future of financial freedom? I just don't think it works. So um, that's not to say that Bitcoin doesn't work because it's proven that it does. It's just that HODL and all of that crap, it's just so upside down. It just doesn't make any sense for economic viability for me. Mm. 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 Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense both for the economic viability and also for the for the mental pain that you have to endure. Oh God, go yeah, that all, all of that, like... all of that. Just sit here, <laughs> just get hit in the face. You're like, no, nah, this is fine. I'm good. You smile. I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm just getting kicked in the balls. It's I'm fine. Buy more. Yeah, I want to go oh, buy, buy more, more because I want to buy get more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, did your wife leave you? Yes, yes. I'm fine. I'm fine. Do your friends hate you? Yes, yes. I'm fine. Because at some point you go, ah, but I was right. I was right. Maybe yeah, I'm right alone. And then, and then six months later, <laughs> did you sell any of it? No, because I like getting kicked in the balls. Please, more of that. Amen. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a, about seven minutes left, but like I, I really want to talk about this um, creator economy. I have quite a few questions about it, so we'll sure, see what ahead. we can get. So probably with your, with a really open view on that that's really going to be interesting so can you can you talk about the differences between web 2 and web 3 for creators and artists in terms of potential so that's kind of this question is more about the theoretical differences because we talk about what's possible but like we haven't seen much yet to be honest we're just thinking oh you can own your own uh, you can own your network and your 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 audience and then take it to another platform and all that stuff like yeah you, you're not going to be dependent anymore on these big web two companies but this is just theory and so after talking about that basically what are the theoretical differences do a reality check today in terms of web web three application usage and even existence for creators what's interesting and what's uh, yeah, well, the, the difference between the Web 2 and Web 3 credit economy is, is, is exactly zero. There is no difference. They're the same people doing the same thing. And just because you add an NFT doesn't make you Web 3, I don't think. Uh, it's, it's the same fundamental mechanics and principles. And I, I also have an issue with people who say, oh, YouTube is bad. Um, no, I don't think it is. I don't think it is bad. Um, Instagram, equally don't think it's bad. They are problematic, yes. But what you are seeing in the creator economy, particularly on YouTube, is extraordinary. It's it's a much bigger thing than saying people are just kind of, you know, getting on board and um, just taking their passions and making videos about them. There is a fundamental shift from, particularly from brands, which is moving direct to consumer. And that's a huge deal. And that has nothing to do with Web3. Web3 has no place in that. But the, the creator economy in general, it would be interesting to see how it rides out a recession if such a thing happens. But there's no doubt that groups of people, groups of humans get their information, get their advice from creators because they've formed this bond with them 
form this relationship with them. If you extrapolate that into Web3, the question is, how does the creator get more value out of that audience? And that's the wrong question for me. Because when you think about the creator economy at the moment, it's build an audience, monetize that audience. So it's extractive. Like you can scale it up massive. You can get to 100 million subscribers. But fundamentally, what you're going to be doing as a business model, when you sit down on a Monday morning, you're going to go, how can I make this audience pay out more? So we're going to have AdSense. We're going to have brand deals. But also, we're going to do merch. So we're going to sell a line of bespoke face massagers with alpaca hair. And it's going to be amazing. It's going to have my name on it. So where does that business sit in six years' time? What is that business? It's a, it's a quick thing. It's not all, not all creative businesses are, are like that, but it tends to be what happens. Like, oh, my own coffee. Oh, like my own line of pens. And because I'm an amazing creator, this is what's going to happen. Um, mm, nah. Uh, but, you know, creators are looking for ways to maximize the revenue from their audiences. And the numbers are staggering. I don't have Mr. Beast's exact figures, but I know it's somewhere around 50 million a year he makes from, yeah. from YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the really extraordinary ones is Amaranth OnlyFans makes around 30 to 40 or something like that. This is on OnlyFans. <sighs> Spicy. So I mean, there's a ton of money washing around here and brands are desperate to try and tap into it and figure out how to tap into those audiences. It's a, it's a big deal. So where I think Web3 has failed is that it's done a really bad job of adding anything new to the discussion. So what we had was a bunch of platforms that were competing with YouTube, but instead of um, instead of paying out an AdSense revenue, you get a, a native token to the platform. For me, that's dead in the water straight away. Um, I saw social tokens spring up, and social tokens were really interesting, but again, I, I think dead in the water. I'm pretty outspoken about creators and tokens in general because I think they're a really bad idea. And... Again, I'll, I'll mention Bankless here. Bankless have a token. It's called Bank. Um, I think it's interesting for incentivizing people to work with you, but I just worry that when you add a, a, a shitcoin to what is essentially media and creativity, all the value inevitably ends up going into the token and not into the brand itself. And in, in the, the worst case scenario, you are motivated and incentivized to work for the token because the token's price is a metric by which you will be judged and you can't really escape that so if the token goes down you are shit if the token goes up you're great but that mm. has no bearing on your ability to create content or anything else and it shouldn't be a metric by which you are judged so creator plus token for me is a terrible model it's a terrible terrible awful model now there's other things that are that are kind of interesting which is creators can own a piece of a platform but again that's not doing the thing that i think web3 should really be doing which is building a third pillar for the creative economy so build an audience monetize that audience the third pillar is can you guess at least in my book what do you think the third pillar should be i mean for me, based on all my thinking about the last few months, but it's, it's, I think it's more like, it's more kind of, it's more wrong based on what you just said, but it's basically how do you, it's basically how do you find a way to make people participate in this, in their favorite creator's success? Yes, you're exactly right. So I, I call it share the spoils. So build an audience, monetize that audience, share the spoils. And it's okay. like, it's, really 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 hard because if if you if you take my position on it, which is like you can't add a shit coin then it becomes really really difficult so to say how do you do that without adding a yeah, shit coin? well th this is or an nft yeah, which at the end is a shit coin with a picture exactly but, so like how do NFT, you do NFT, that nfts actually serve a really good purpose because they they add identity to shit coin mechanics and they add um a sense of community in a way that a shit coin can't and they are unique and they are desirable and they have characteristics which uh, have hierarchies within them. That's really interesting. But yeah, you, the, the first thing you think of is like, oh, I, I want to return value to, to my community. So watch a video, I'll give you a token. But a token doesn't have any value unless it gets pumped and therefore you introduce those mechanics again. So you have to 
you have to really do the hard work and think about how does how do we get something valuable to people and value can come in lots of different ways so value can be access and i think a lot of web2 creators have figured that out and do patreon pages and this kind of thing so you get additional content additional access but for me that always feels like uh, it's just like sort of gating things and, and it doesn't really get there for me like the only token that anyone's really going to give a shit about is cash like real money so you have to figure out as a project how to give you know if you're a creator how to return real yield because that's what it is back to your community now the first thing you're going to say is well doesn't that make it security uh no not necessarily uh you can pay people for work and so where i get to with, with this is if i'm a creator and i'm asking you to share my content or to watch my content or to be a fan of my content and you're doing that work then that's work and why couldn't you be a full-time fan of what i'm doing so you are genuinely participating in what i'm doing so you have a job effectively and your job is to do x well what that x is we can define it but that is x your expectations of success, revenue, profit, whatever you might want to call it, are then based on the work that you do and not the work that I do. And therefore, it's not a security. So there are ways to get around it. But like you said, it's really, really difficult. And so the only way to, to figure that out and then to use some of the primitives in, in Web3 that are really exciting, like DAOs or governance and these kind of things, but without adding a shitcoin, you have to experiment. And so you have to be willing to go into a place with your community where they'll experiment with you. And I think that's the thing that Web2 existing creators, particularly at scale, won't be able to do because it's too risky. Why would they pivot to something? Yeah. So that's why somewhere right now in Web3, a creator is starting to, to will rise up, I predict, in the next three months that does this and does it in such a way that they completely transform the way we think about how creators and communities are aligned incentives, you know, incentivized together because it has to happen. And web three can make that happen, but you just got to be in a position where you go, I don't have the answer, but I have a process. And if you're willing to go with me on that, then this could actually be really awesome. The good thing is once you figure that shit out, you can just, package it up, turn it into a service and sell it to every other creator that might want it in the same way that you have, you know, services for translation or services for anything else. Like, like Web3 community as a service will be a thing. And that's it. Sounds so easy, right? Sounds so easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's doable though. It is doable. So it's basically like setting up a share. I mean, it's like basically being a, a, a creator a creator shareholder but you're not a shareholder you're, you're basically employee. getting back to yeah you're we're basically getting back to yeah, yeah you can't be a shareholder because then you get into trouble that's the problem um and you can't sell a share in it because again you get into trouble so it has to be it has to be employment it has to be a form of employment contract and that 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 is somewhat of a an interesting topic to get into because it, it leads you into things like soul band tokens and or non-transferable tokens and that's really interesting and you know because if you if you ask someone to sign a contract and you you need to ensure that only that person is bound by that contract but also that their, their signature is not transferable and cannot be just sold to somebody else and then they get that the benefit of that and then it has to be a soul band token so you know maintaining your head above the regulatory waters that's a difficult bit but anyway th this is all stuff that you know if you say it and you try and figure it out then somebody will help you build it okay awesome um, i wish i wish we could continue to talk about that stuff <laughs> but uh probably is going to be in another episode to up for it for sure because I think for sure it's been already an hour 20 minutes now and uh, wow time flies right. when you talk about we didn't even talk about what happened in 2022. We, we, there's too many things we didn't talk about. No. But, uh, but that was awesome. Thank you so much. No worries, man. I hope, you have, some, uh, I hope you have some pleasure. And um, 
yeah some fun thank you well i always have fun in this space and um i'm hoping that when people see what we're up to next they'll uh they'll have a laugh with this too because god knows we need it absolutely absolutely thank you so much man go man take care